I don't want anybody to be near the end of their life. I don't care how old you are. Okay, that's not my, that's not my hope. I want you to imagine you're at the end of your life. You're... You need to, to, to do something for for your your family, for your town, for your community, and you want to leave them something. But what what, what could it be? What could you leave something that would have a, a lasting impact? And, and maybe you'll decide to think of each of the people in your family and to write a letter, telling them what they think is important for them to hear. Something that they won't see until after you, you've passed away. Not, but, but, to your heart, to your heart, and that you need to communicate. Most of us, most of us, Son and I, had 55, 56 years of experience. And we've had 60, 70, maybe even 80. I don't know how old you are. I'm not bothered to ask. I've been very good about that. But you've had lots and lots and lots of experience. And you've learned an awful lot over the, the, the time that you've been alive that it'll be worth to share with the next generation and to prepare them to, to live it out. As we come to the last two chapters of Joshua, that's exactly what Joshua intends to do. Exactly what Joshua intends to do. After a long time, this is from Joshua chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua by then, old and well advanced in years, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted an inheritance for your tribes, all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the great sea to the west. The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised. He's coming to the point where he realizes he's coming to the end of his life. He wants to share something with the people of Israel that they'll never forget, that they'll always hold on to, that they'll always grasp. Scripture tells us that Joshua was 110 years old when he passed away. We find his epitaph in chapter 24, verses 29 and 30. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnasserah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. You know, you, you find in that little epitaph three important things. One is a joke, or at least has become a joke in, in, to a lot of places, because you'll hear the joke put this way, can you tell me two people who didn't have an earthly father? And, and the one it, most people get, that's Jesus. He, he, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He didn't have an earthly father. The one that people stall at is Joshua because he was the son of Nun. And of course, Nun was his, the joke is that Nun was actually his father's name, not, not the fact that he had no father, but it comes off <laughs> sounding like he had no father. Joshua, the son of Nun. It also tells us in his epitaph that he was buried in his hometown. The land that was his. I don't expect to get buried in my hometown. Most of us have probably moved away from our home. Maybe some of you were raised here in the Rochester area, mm -hmm. but I wasn't. I was raised out in California. I don't expect to go to California and die and be, or be here and be carried to California to be buried. I'll be buried here or wherever my home is at the time that I, I die. Mm -hmm. And that'll be okay. But Joshua was buried in his home, the place that was his, the place that he was given by God for his own. What a wonderful thing. But it says something else. Probably the most wonderful, the, the greatest tribute that could be given to a man. And that the other thing it says in his epitaph that he is that he was the servant of the Lord. 
There are only three people that are called the servant of the Lord. Uh, the first in Scripture was, was, was Moses, who led the people from the Promised Land up to the Jordan River, and he passed away and was buried, uh, was buried shortly afterwards. And then it was up to Joshua to take the, the Israelite nation and take the people across the Jordan River and conquer the remainder of the Promised Land. The, the Palestine was to be theirs. He was a servant of the Lord. And then when Joshua dies at 110, there's 400 years of silence. Joshua was alive about the year 1400. It's an approximation, but about the year 1400. The next person to be called the servant of the Lord is David. And David dates from about 1000 BC. So there's 400 years from one, one man being called servant of the Lord to the next. That doesn't mean there were no servants of the Lord. But that epitaph, that label was not put on any man. And David the king was called a servant. And then nobody. Nobody in the Old Testament, nobody in the New Testament is given that title. Jesus isn't called the servant of the Lord. Now he was obviously a servant, don't get me wrong, I understand he served God all his day. But he wasn't called the servant of the Lord. Paul wasn't called servant of the Lord. Peter wasn't called the servant of the Lord. I'm not saying they weren't servants, but they weren't called that. Moses, Joshua, and David. You know, I can't think of something I wouldn't... I don't expect to be a Moses. I don't expect to be a, 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 a Joshua. I don't expect to be a David. But it would be really nice if the people who know me best, when I finally pass away, could put on top of my tombstone. A servant of the Lord. Yeah. I think it's true to all of us. If we could say that, it would be just a wonderful day. Um, I'm not going to be a Moses. I'm not going to be a Joshua. I'm not going to be a David. I want to be a servant of the Lord. The job that he gives me to do. And so now he's coming to the end of his life. It's, it's time for him to, 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 to report to the king. And, and to take his place in heaven and to serve God in a different setting. And he wants to call his people to the throne. He wants to call his people to serve God. And he does that in two steps. He does it first by looking at the past, reminding, reminding the people what God has done. And then he says he wants to look to the future and asking them to make a commitment of their own life about where they need to be and what they need to do. We'll talk about both of those, the past and then the future. Joshua begins by calling his people to remember what God has done. Be strong, he says. Be strong. Be very careful to follow all the instruction written in the books of the law of Moses. He looks back to Moses and to the law that Moses gave, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, the law, the Torah. I, I, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a little secret. And there's, there's about eight of you, and there were eight people in our service this morning. And you take those, those two groups of eight, and you may be the only people who are going to know this little secret about me. And this, <laughs> see, you're going to be, you're going to be in. Now, you, you, can't, you can't share this with anybody. <laughs> unless you tell them about the tape, and they can go look at the tape, and they'll know it. Two. The secret is this. I don't like history. Now, my wife likes history. I don't like history. You know, give me a math book. Give me a computer science book. Give me a science book. Not history. In fact, when I was in seminary, I went to one of my seminary profs and said to him, you know, I'd rather not take the final exam. Is there something I can do instead? And he was right. He had to say no. But I had to ask. Because I knew what the answer was, but I didn't ask. I don't like history. You know, no, I read enough. I gather. I put it together. I don't know what I know. You know, I, I probably was one of those people that that Rich Litterer was talking about in his book Anguished English. And in Anguished English, he tells some of the, the facts of history from 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 kids' point of view. Uh, for example, he he he, te he tells us that there were some kids who were writing history exams, and one of them said the Bible is full of many interesting caricatures. He got the humor. Noah's wife was called Joan of Ark. Oh. Uh, Lot's wife 
was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. <laughs> and then there was Moses, he tells, that he, some of the kids told him. There was Moses that went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, but he died before he ever reached Canada. <laughs> uh, did you know that Solomon had 300 wives and 700 porcupines? <laughs> you know, and I, I think I think maybe that one would have been mine. I would have gotten that one wrong. I would have moved something up, I'm sure. And then, did you know what a epistle? You know what a epistle is, don't you? A epis, epistle is the wife of an apostle. Oh. Now that's the way I would have done history. If you, if you, if, and I don't know that any of those were actually my my statements. So don't go saying, "Well, Pastor Johnson said these things." But I'm the kind of guy that likes history just enough that those could have been mine. Yeah. Uh, but Joshua, he realized the value of history to teach us something of what God had done, what God was wanting to do in His people as they looked back to the past mm -hmm. and preparing them to serve God in the future. He reminds them in, in, in chapter 23 of all that God has done. He helped clear the land so that it could be settled. God said he would do it. God said he'd get rid of, uh, clear the land that they could have all of Palestine. And you know what? He did it. Amazing. He did it. If you're going to memorize a verse, right? Uh, memorization isn't quite as popular as it was, you know, 20 years ago. But if you wanted to memorize a verse, or put a verse on a 3 by 5 card that you could look at day after day, even if you didn't memorize it, just to, to help you remember, it would be Joshua 23, 14. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Joshua, at the end of his life, still recognized that God is in the business of being faithful to what he says and to those who belong to him. You know, sometimes as we age, and I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, like they say, and that's not fair because you're all here. And so, probably, so this, this may not apply to you, but it may help you understand people around you that, that, that as we age, we fall into the trap of thinking that God no longer matters. Take time now. While you can still make the decision, you can still think about what God means, to begin to install, uh, to strengthen your walk, you can install habits, install practices in your life that even as Joshua's was, you can remain faithful all of your life to following the Lord, even when it's difficult. Joshua had his people look to the past. He also wanted to get his people to look to the future. He wasn't satisfied just living back there. He wanted to think ahead and, and see what was coming. And so that's the focus of chapter 24. He wants them to make what is called a covenant. Now we don't hear that word too much, maybe in terms of a marriage covenant. Uh, but, a, but a covenant in the Old Testament was a legal document. It was, it was binding, impetuity, no, that's not the right word, and forever. Now, that's going to be on the tape, we're going to be in trouble here. But, but it, was, it was binding forever and ever. Um, and it wasn't just in the Old Testament, it was throughout the Middle East. For instance, there's a headache document that someone found that has all of the elements of a covenant. It starts out by naming the parties that are involved. I'm making a covenant between you and me, and I named Sondra Johnson and, and Floyd Johnson. It has a historical summary of the past relations between the parties. It talks about how they, how they met and, and maybe some of the difficulties they've had, and it talks about where they are today. And then they make a stipulation to honor and to obey till death do us part. We make that commitment to each other. And then we have a list of witnesses. You know, maybe God's one of the witnesses, but so may the people of Israel, people surrounding. And then there's a list of sanctions. What to expect if we don't keep those promises? And, Jesus, and, and Joshua calls the, the people of Israel to make a covenant. 
Now this covenant has a, a big gotcha in the middle of it. You'd think it would be nice and easy to say, yes, we'll follow the Lord. But listen to, to, to the conversation. I'm picking out some pieces of it, but it's the gist of what's said. In verse 14, Joshua tells the people, honor the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. I expect Joshua to say that. The people reply. The people reply, we would never forsake the Lord. Good words. And then Joshua turns it around and he tells them, you are not able, in verse 19, he says, you are not able to serve the Lord for he is holy and jealous. He is God. You know, it's ironic. God calls the people to follow. Joshua calls the people to follow God, but then he tells them that he can't. You know, I almost feel like he's echoing something that I've said over and over. You've heard me say it. And that is that we're broken people. We're not able to do everything God wants us to do. And, 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 and Joshua understood that. He told his people that they couldn't do it. They're, they're, you're going to blow it, guys. And yet they were willing to make the commitment to follow. You know what's ironic, too? is that the very Savior, the very Jesus Christ who died on the cross, and if it was my church at, up there in Garland, we'd have a cross on the wall. I don't expect you to put one here, but you can imagine it's there. Every church has one. This one doesn't, but you can imagine it's there. That very Jesus who died on the cross is the same Jesus when we put our lives into his hands, makes it capable. He died so that we could be forgiven because we can't keep his commandments, but he also said the same Jesus who empowers us to do what he wants us to do. Mm -hmm. Harry Emerson Fosdick once wrote, Fear imprisons, faith liberates. Fear paralyzes, faith empowers. Fear disheartens, faith encourages. Fear sickens, faith heals. Fear makes useless. Faith makes serviceable. But most of all, fear puts hopelessness at the heart of life, while faith rejoices in its God. Mm -hmm. I don't know that where you stand in relation to God, but I, like Joshua so many years ago, want to call you to make a commitment to follow Jesus. Now, I can't give you an altar call. We did in our church this morning. But as we sing this next hymn, you can respond to God and say, yes, I will follow him. Mm -hmm. You can't come to the altar. We don't have an altar. It wouldn't be appropriate to build one here. I'm sure that, that they, would, they would find it a bit of a nuisance to put an altar here just for us. But your altar can be right where you are because you're bowing before God where you're at. Yeah. Let, me, it, it, let me ask you, where are you at? Do you know that your relation to God, to God is strong? Do you know that your relation to, to God is where it needs to be? If you need to renew your relationship, if you need to begin that relationship, let me call you to serve Him as we say our final hymn. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way.